Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm your host, Kelee Akina. My guest today is Dr. Scott Grosskreutz. He's practiced radiology on Hawaii Island for almost three decades. Scott's also an active member of the Hawaii Physician Shortage Crisis Task Force. Now, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Hawaii has an acute physician shortage and is in need of thousands of healthcare workers. On our neighbor islands, especially where Scott resides and practices, these shortages are especially concerning since delays can often mean life or death situations. Scott joins me today to discuss the state's healthcare crisis, and we're also going to talk about what steps legislators can take to address it. Thanks for joining me today, Scott Grosskreutz. Glad to have you on the program again. It's nice to be here again, Professor. Thank you for the invitation. Well, first of all, tell me a little bit about your own background and specifically how you got involved with the Hawaii Physician Shortage Crisis Task Force. Well, I've been living in Hilo since um, 1993 and providing care in the community at the hospitals and uh, I served as the chief of staff at Hilo Medical Center, and, and it became clear many years ago that we had a, a constant and, uh, and chronic shortage of healthcare providers in, in far too many areas. And, you know, this, this shortage of healthcare providers has been documented by the Area Health Education Center at the University of Hawaii. Uh, the projections of physician shortages have been anywhere from, you know, 800 to 1,000 over the last several years, depending on the, the methodology that they use. Uh, but it, it goes beyond that. We also have severe shortages of APRNs and uh, PAs who are a critical part of our, our primary care provider uh, workforce here on the Big Island and on the neighbor islands. And we also have a severe shortage of nurses. Um, and so this has impacted the care of many patients. And you know, a recent uh, access to healthcare study by Community First and the Hawaii Rural Health Association you know, did document many people are having a real problem uh, you know, accessing health care in the neighbor islands. And, and many were actually thinking of moving just to be able to get better access to health care, which is a problem. So, Scott, you're saying that it's not just a shortage of physicians. It's a shortage of nurses and other staff as well. And uh, on the neighbor islands, it's especially acute. Now, uh, I've heard stories that our neighbor island friends simply can't get a, a, an appointment with a specialist and have to fly to Oahu or or to the mainland quite frequently. Uh, how bad is it, especially where you are on the Big Island? Well, it's it's fairly significant. Our, our shortage of physicians has been calculated to be 40 to 50% for the last several years, and, and that certainly feels about right. Uh, you know, we know that we many of the APRNs and, and, uh, and PAs we work with are also, you know, stretched thin with very large patient panels. Uh, you know, people are burning the candle with both ends and often doing, you know, 60, 70 hour work weeks trying to keep up with the uh, with the amount of work that that needs to be done for our patients. And it's still not enough. And, you know, historically, I guess the the idea would be you, you would have, you know, kind of uh, more assets and resources on Oahu, which is to be expected for a big city, but that you would fly as, you know, as many people as possible. But that is extremely expensive to fly people. And then recently, you know, due to a tragedy, the air ambulance system was suspended. And so people couldn't get off the island. So uh, the, the lesson here is that we need to develop uh, the healthcare systems at our neighbor islands so that we can take care of our neighbors appropriately here locally, you know, as often as is medically practical and reasonable. Now, you just mentioned an air ambulance crash recently. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that and what it exposed about the vulnerability of patients on neighbor islands. Well, you know, over the years, uh, especially when I was working uh, closely at the emergency room Kilo Medical Center, you know, doing a lot of trauma reads there, uh, you know, there just were many, many patients that we saw that needed to be transferred right away. I mean, and that's because we didn't have the, the resources in-house to take care of them. Certain, certain medical conditions like trauma and stroke and, and, uh, and heart attacks, you know, time is money. You either fix it now or else uh, often there's no chance to repair the damage later. Uh, so, we, you know, when we, when we can't move people quickly to, uh, with their ambulance, uh, we've had some bad outcomes over the years. And, you know, these folks are, are the, on their ambulance, they're, they're doing a wonderful job. They're, they're, they, 
are heroic in many ways. And uh, I, I think many times because of the need to get patients you know, elsewhere for treatment, you know, they, they fly in conditions that normally they, they probably would not prefer to fly in, you know, and then that, that has its risks. So there was a recent flight uh, going from, uh, from Maui to, uh, to the uh, to North Hawaii area that, that crashed, unfortunately, and caused suspension of, uh, of air ambulance services for a period of time. Well, it would seem that if we could solve the shortage of medical personnel, we wouldn't have to depend upon flying people from island to island or even to the mainland. But uh, let's get back to the problem itself of the shortage. Uh, as you and I have discussed on many occasions, there are a lot of factors that are involved. It's not just one single causality, um, ranging from the retirement rate of physicians and the things that are actually incentivized earlier retirements than otherwise to the tax issues, Medicare reimbursement, as well as the overall cost of living in, in, in Hawaii. Let, let's take these item by item. And I, I know there's one that you you might possibly be considering now, and that's retirement. Talk a little bit about that and, and how that's affecting the supply of medical personnel. Um, we, we have a lot of, of folks that are uh, kind of getting long in the tooth and they're practicing into their uh, their late 60s and 70s. In fact, a good percentage of our of our healthcare workforce is, is in that position. And so there's a whole cohort of, of people that are uh, nearing retirement. Um, and I mean, to be honest, uh, you know, it's, I mean, usually people in healthcare, whether you're a doctor, nurse or whatever, you're, you're you know, they're usually not too much whiners, you know, they, you're, we're used to hard work, we're used to lots of training, we're used to, you know, keeping your nose to the grindstone. But, you know, the hours involved with uh, that are required to try to keep up with the level of healthcare needs of the community. You know, it's one thing to be working, you know, sleepless nights or 60 or 70 hour weeks, you know, when you're an intern, it gets to be a little bit more challenging when you're, you know, you're 60 or 65 or 70. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, a lot of the younger, you know, people coming out of training want to have more of a work-life balance, you know, and uh, have more time for their family. And that's understandable too. But I think the bottom line is there are uh, as a good portion of our healthcare force that's about ready to retire out, uh, and we just don't have any replacements for those individuals. You talked about younger people and some of the goals that they have, such as a more balanced work-life uh, uh, practice, but um, they're also facing other issues as well, uh, cost of living. Uh, sometimes people think doctors are just extremely highly paid individuals and shouldn't have to worry about the, the things that ordinary people do, but but is that really the case, especially for people coming into practice or those in private practice and so forth, and especially younger personnel who are entering the medical fields? Uh, how does the cost of living impact them here in Hawaii, everything from housing to food? Well, it, it impacts things a lot like it does for people in, in every you know uh, job occupation or or profession, but it gets to be a little bit cha more challenging, especially if folks uh, have got very high debt loads from from training. Uh, and just to give an example, my my daughter Malia is uh, born and raised in Hawaii. She wants to come back home. Uh, she's completed a dermatology residency. Now she's doing a Mohs surgery uh, training uh, fellowship, where she'll learn how to remove skin cancers and do plastic type surgery to, to help uh, people rebuild you know, uh, their faces or whatever after after the cancers are removed. And so, you know, pretty rigorous stuff. Um, her, her and her physician husband have got, um, you know, a debt burden from college and medical school and things like that of, of about $400,000. Uh, and so, you know, if she were to come back and, and, uh, and, and try to, uh, say, open up a private practice uh, between paying off the debt burden that they have for education and paying for, you know, trying to get a house, uh, there, there might not be much money left, you know, that they would have access to for, for other things, you know, like, uh, for example, even, even helping, you know, build their practice or hire the necessary people. So, uh, you know, that's a real challenge. The, the cost of providing medical services, like all services in Hawaii, are the highest in the country, you know, by far. And the reimbursements from Medicare, Medicaid, local insurance companies are, 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 are actually right near the bottom. And then the other challenge we have is that the state of Hawaii is a, a unique general excise tax on everything, pretty much. Uh, and it's, we're the only 
state of, in America that, that taxes Medicare, TRICARE, uh, and Medicaid programs, and we're only one of two states that broadly tax uh, health care. And so anyway, that's that's a problem because if you you often will break even uh, caring for Medicare patients and you'll lose money care, you know, caring for Medicaid patients. And then the state of Hawaii will come in and says, well, listen, we don't care whether you're losing money providing care for these folks who really need it. We're going to still charge you a get tax on your gross income. And so, you know, if, if you're already losing money, the get tax just ensures that practices, you know, go into the red and, and often, they, you know, they, they have a hard time surviving in Hawaii. Now, when you talk about Medicare reimbursement and about the general excise tax that's imposed upon medical services, we're really looking at the business aspect of medicine. And, and I don't think necessarily that most physicians and medical personnel went into the, the profession to do the business, but the, basically it sounds like they're becoming overwhelmed by the cost of business, especially if you're going to be in private practice. Now, we've seen a lot of people leave private practice or retire early or simply give up their aspirations. And, and that's a real hit to people who live on the neighbor islands where we don't have as extensive an availability of clinics and so forth. Uh, talk a little bit about that, how, how doctors and other personnel in private practice are especially impacted by the Medicare rates for, for reimbursement, as well as the GET. Yeah, well, well, the people in private practice, you know, that might be your, your, your family practitioner, uh, you know, or AP or other physician that you're seeing in their, their practice. They, they've come here, they built their practice, they, you know, hired individuals, they've paid for all kinds of computer systems and things like that. Uh, and maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars or more in equipment to, uh, so they could, they could practice medicine. And in private practice here, uh, you know, it's just, it's very difficult. Um, the, the state of Hawaii has, you know, the, again, these unique taxation models that, uh, that nobody else in the, in, the, in the country really has that, that put a tremendous burden on trying to stay afloat. Now, uh, when it comes down to, to hospitals and hospital employed physicians and nurses, uh, Kaiser systems, things like that, all those, those other uh, healthcare systems, they're exempt from the GET. In fact, the head of the Healthcare Association of Hawaii said that if the GET tax were applied to our island's hospitals, that many of them would have to reduce services or close their doors. Uh, and so we probably have about half of the healthcare providers uh, in medicine in the state of Hawaii in private practice, but that number is decreasing pretty rapidly year by year. Um, and again, the financial aspects play a great part of it. it you know, I used to really focus on how can we do the best job possible working with, you know, our, our colleagues and different disciplines and providing the best, you know, care we can for, say, breast cancer or other conditions. But, but recently it's become clear that we have to almost fight to be able to stay in business at all and probably provide any level of care. Hmm. Now, Scott, you've been helpful toward our efforts at the Grassroot Institute to educate the public and lawmakers about what's going on in terms of the impact of the general excise tax on medical personnel. And you know that we're currently circulating a petition to the public that we're going to present to the governor and lawmakers calling for um, the exemption of medical services from the state general excise tax. Now, uh, as, as you look at that, um, can, can, can you tell us a, a little bit more as to why that's so important to call for that kind of exemption and whether you think that that's feasible and possible during this upcoming legislative term. Well, I, I think I appreciate the grassroots uh, leadership in that area. It is completely possible and it, it's uh, quite logical and it should happen. Uh, when you take a look at things where we've got a, a documented worsening healthcare shortage that's been going on for several decades, you've got a, a national shortage of doctors and nurses that's going to get worse. We're going to have a harder time recruiting. You have a physician as a chief executive who, who wants to improve access to healthcare. That's Dr. Green. You have, uh, you know, billion dollar surpluses in the budget as far as the eye can see. Uh, you know, it just seems to, to, to make a lot of sense to, to have a healthcare system that encourages people to come to Hawaii and set a practice, especially younger practitioners, and that doesn't actually punitively push them out of the healthcare system. 
uh, you know, basically what we're doing with some of these programs like Medicare, TRICARE, and Medicaid is that we're taxing patients and then the physicians are forced, you know, they're basically paying their patients taxes for health care. So that, of course, is regressive, uh, but it it's kind of has the same sort of effect if you were to charge, you know, police officers, you know, for fighting crime or you were to charge firemen for fighting fires. It just, it makes absolutely no sense, you know, intellectually, and it has very deleterious uh, effects on, on the workforce. And uh, one of the things that I think is a real tragedy is that as the number of people in private practice, which is the only area of, of medicine that's taxed by the GET, continues to decrease every year, Kali'i, in a fairly short period of time, uh, the amount of taxation from taxing, you know, uh, doctors and nurses and APRs, that's going to go down a lot. You know, at some point it'll go down to zero, not right away, but it's it's kind of like uh, having a flock of sheep that sheep that you use to, you know, for the wool, and then you start throwing them on the barbecue, you know, for for uh, <laughs> it's pretty soon there's not a lot of the flock left to to you know to to be able to benefit, you know, from uh, for the society, and so that that's my concern. During the COVID pandemic, we really saw our healthcare provider system stressed to the limit. Um, it's not that the pandemic caused this shortage, it's that we had one going into it, as you and I have talked about before. And uh, the interesting thing is that we really felt the shortage of nurses and other healthcare professionals, so much so that the, the state decided to go ahead and lift a, a regulation that it had, which before didn't permit out-of-state licensed healthcare professionals to practice here readily in Hawaii. And, and that was just so necessary. And people saw that we could actually benefit by allowing professionals trained in other states to come in and practice in Hawaii. What are your thoughts about turning that into a, a permanent feature of, of our healthcare practice over here? How much would that help us? I think it would help uh, some, particularly when there's a tie, you know, times of crisis. I, I believe Governor Ige this summer declared there was an immediate peril to public health when he, he uh, basically waived uh, state licensing you know, for nurses to come to the state. And sometimes states will have a number of states put together and they have a pact and say, listen, if you're licensed in my state and we know we've got rigorous standards that you, it's okay to practice in the other states within the pact. And I think that's that's well worth looking at. So it's it's a, a solution, um, and it, I think that makes sense to pursue it. Um, but more than anything else, we need to train up more young people who are local, and we know we'll stay if they, if they got the opportunity and have a and can have a fiscally so, you know uh, viable practice here, uh, and then just try to set up a, a situation where they can be successful. An important part of that is helping them live here in this economy. And, and doctors, they've invested a lot in their training and their education, personally, financially, and they expect an appropriate re reward financially. But many of them, as you and I have mentioned, find housing itself hard to afford. Uh, how related do you feel the issue of housing shortages to the difficulty of attracting new doctors and retaining recent graduates here in Hawaii? Um, I think it's a it's a big issue. There was a recent article in the uh, Financial Times of London about housing in Hawaii and how that's impacting, uh, you know, uh, health access to health care. So it, it, it's it's big enough that it's catching, you know, the attention of, of, of major you know publications worldwide. Um, from a personal point of view, we, we had a fantastic uh, uh, breast radiologist who was coming here basically to replace to be my replacement as, as I was supposed to retire. But, uh, you know, he, he couldn't find a house that he and his wife could afford. Um, and so they went back to the mainland. Um, so it, mm. it does. It is a real thing. It does have a, a big impact. We've got to hit those problems together. Indeed the entire complex of issues that makes it difficult for people to live here in Hawaii. Well, as we come to the close of our, our chat together today, what are some things we can do in the immediate future? What could our legislature act upon coming up uh, that could help us to make some advancement in solving the problem of medical personnel shortage? Well, I think the low hanging fruit here is the general excise tax, because, you know, again, to have to be the only place in the country that has this sort of tax that, that discourages private practice, 
that's a fixable problem. The uh, the Tax Foundation of Hawaii and its president were, were very kind. They helped draft two general excise tax bills. One was for a broad exemption for doctors, nurses, and APRNs. The other is is more circumscribed just for federal programs of Medicare, Medicaid, and TRICARE. And we understand from some big island, uh, big island senators are going to be introducing those into the Senate, which I think is, is, is a big plus. There was a bill that was introduced in the 2020 session that we, we helped uh, try to, to put together. It was SB 2542 to exempt a general exemption for uh, for health care. And that actually passed the Senate by a vote of 25 to zero. And then the House didn't hear it because the COVID pandemic uh, hit and they, they limited the session. But I, but I think the very fact that, that one of the two bodies in the state legislature was unanimously in favor of doing this for logical and practical reasons to improve access to care, I think that was encouraging to lead. That's good to hear. He, I, I want to make sure that our viewers understand the urgency of the situation we're talking about today. Uh, tell us what you think Hawaii would be like in five or 10 years if we don't take the right steps now to stem off the medical personnel shortage? Well, we, we have, again, a very uh, top-heavy uh, workforce, you know, with, with older and even, you know, senior senior providers. You know, I'm of Medicare age and, and passed it already. Um, so you're going to see that, that cohort retire. They can't keep going on forever. Uh, and then you're going to see that the deficits we have, uh, and right now there was a national study of the 3,000 counties in America, and the Big Island had the third worst shortage of healthcare providers in primary care. Maui had the fifth worst shortage of, of healthcare providers in, in America, and, and Kauai had the 13th worst shortage. And so as this huge cohort of maybe as much of a quarter to a third as, as of our providers retire in the next three to five years, you're going to find it almost... Many people will find it almost impossible, I think, to, to get, you know, to have their own health, you know, family doctor or to get access for care or to get an OBGYN. Uh, and that, unfortunately, I mean, the real problem here is that is the fact that the, that the healthcare providers are having a hard time. It's just that if we can't make a go of it or we don't have enough people within our team, then the patients have access to care issues. And Department of Health statistics show that the, the mortality or the death rate, if you um, for, for many conditions like stroke and heart attack and cancer and trauma and COPD and asthma and adolescent deaths and suicide is much higher, significantly higher on, on the neighbor islands than it is on Oahu where they tend to have more healthcare resources. Scott, those are some compelling thoughts. Uh, any last word? If you were sitting down face to face with one of our legislators or our governor, what would you say? Um, I would say to be bold here. I understand that there's uh, things are done a certain way, uh, and sometimes we are reluctant to proceed in in fresh directions. Um, but the, the crisis is so real, so well documented, and so uh, impelling that something needs to be done now. It simply can't be deferred for several more years. Uh, so we. You know, the, the, one of the things we can do right now is is to try to, uh, you know, to to get some level of tax relief to re allow remaining uh, healthcare systems and and health practices to stay viable, and that in turn should help you know attract and and us have us attract you know younger providers coming out of training, um, and it should be reminded, of course, that you know all these training tracks for medicine that they're long, they're long for nursing, they're long for PAs. You know, for, for physicians, it's four years of college, four years of medical school, a year of internship, three to five years of, uh, of residency. And then it takes you often another one, two years of fellowship. So, you know, it, it, you've got a, almost like a, a, a 10 to 12 year track before people are even ready to, you know, to put out their shingle and start providing services. So, you know, there's, there's just simply no time to delay. Well, that's a huge investment. Scott, thank you very much for being with us today. I appreciate your expertise. A pleasure. My guest today on Hawaii Together has been Scott Grosskreutz. He's with the Hawaii Physician Shortage Crisis Task Force. And as always, he understands the situation well and is able to explain it. We really have to do something about the physician crisis, shortage crisis, as well as the shortage in personnel across the medical fields here in Hawaii. 
Thank you for being with us. You're watching Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until next time, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.